right, I see a couple of people in the audience who've already seen a, a good number of these slides. Um, and in fact, one in the audience who I stole a number of these slides from. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, uh, um, so uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, if you've seen these slides, or in the, and I know a little bit later they're going to get a little dry in places, um, I suggest you go to the uh, Microsoft blog. On Monday, we recently um, put out a, uh, a note on some work that we've been doing recently with Case Western Reserve University on quantum-inspired algorithms. Um, in particular, using quantum-inspired algorithms to improve uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting. Okay, and so uh, we can produce MRI scans with higher resolution in a fraction of the time that they need to now run. Um, now, obviously, this is uh, research, and so by the time it gets to market, maybe some years to come. But, uh, but this really has the, uh, an opportunity to change the way uh, we do healthcare diagnosis in the future. Okay. Um, also on the blog, you'll find uh, from a couple weeks ago a uh, collaboration with Willis Towers, Towers Watson, a major insurance firm, um, also using quantum-inspired algorithms to uh, improve the speed and efficiency of risk modeling which of course is the, one of the major components in insurance. And so quantum inspired algorithms, um, well, they're real and they're here today. And so uh, my name is Brad Lackey, I'm a principal researcher. I will be your uh, substitute lecturer for this talk. Uh, Matthias Troyer was uh, really hoping to give this himself, but uh, unfortunately is out of the uh, country today. So I'll be covering this. Um, I'm gonna talk about chemistry, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I work in quantum inspired optimization. Okay, so I, uh, take a little, since uh, questions came up, I'll take a little bit of time at the beginning to talk about this rather than at the end. Um, there are multiple modal, uh, modes of quantum computing, or maybe models of quantum computing is a more traditional way of saying it. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is really these chemistry applications are based on the gate model approach, which is really the focus of, uh, of this entire workshop. But there are other models. So for instance, if you study cryptography, um, some co popular cryptographic protocols such as multi-party computation or blind computation, there are quantum versions of that, but they're not built on the gate model like we're gonna see today, but they're built on another model of computation called measurement-based quantum computation. Okay, in that uh, setting, you don't have uh, a circuit like we're gonna see a lot. You have a, what's called a cluster state or just a large entangled state. And you make small measurements on pieces of it and adaptively tune those to push the computation in the direction you wanna go. And so it looks very different. Um, another model is adiabatic quantum computing, which is really what I specialize in, um, also a universal model. Uh, this is based on old ideas from physics, the adiabatic theorem, which came around the 1920s, so it's been around for 100 years. In this case, you prepare a system uh, which you sort of understand everything about, so it's easy to construct, and then slowly transform that system into one whose lowest energy configuration solves the problem of interest. And the adiabatic theorem says as long as this transformation moves slowly enough, the system will stay in that lowest energy configuration. And so at the end, you've solved the problem. Okay, and uh, in many ways, adiabatic quantum computing isn't as popular today because it's been around for 100 years, and so there's a huge amount of machinery to simulate this type of physics. Okay, and so we have very, very good classical algorithms that we can run on computers today that will simulate adiabatic evolution. Okay, so if I can take an adiabatic quantum algorithm, and these are optimization algorithms that are really easy to cast in the adiabatic model, then we can simulate these. On, on computers we have today. And so we actually are running quantum algorithms, but we're running simulations of what would happen. Uh, sometimes they're not perfect simulations, they're analogous simulations of what would happen and solving problems using these algorithms. And so that often goes to the name of quantum inspired optimization. Okay, and so that's, uh, um, if you read through our blog post, you'll see we have a lot of partnerships. Almost all of our corporate partnerships are based on that. Optimization is a big deal in industry, huge deal in industry. Okay, and so any type of speed ups solving highly non-convex, large optimization problems are gonna have real applications. Okay, but 
That's, uh, that's something completely different because adiabatic, um, adiabatic optimization, adiabatic quantum computing is, is a hard way to think about computing. We've sort of grown up with computers uh, in the sort of von Neumann architectures that we're familiar with today where you have a register and you apply some gates to a register and that makes sense to us intuitively. And so to develop algorithms is much easier since we have that intuition to do it, even though developing quantum algorithms itself is a very, very hard task, developing a model that's completely alien to us is even harder. Right, so there's really not a lot of adiabatic quantum algorithms out there because they're very, very challenging to come up with. Okay, so, uh, so instead we're going to focus on some gate model stuff and in particular I'm going to talk about um, a collaboration that we had with Pacific Northwest National Labs um, in integrating their uh, quantum chemistry package in WChem into using the QD, uh, um, quantum development kit, the QDK, and, uh, and okay, let me, just, let me get going. So. Uh, so quantum programming, um, well, that's what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. All right, so we, we want to develop algorithms, but we want to run those algorithms. And so to run these algorithms, uh, we need a programming language to work with. And here I'm going to talk about Q Sharp, uh, that being the, the, uh, the topic of the day. Um, and so really what I'll focus on today is using um, a implementation of an algorithm in Q Sharp to count the number of gates and qubits that are necessary to run the algorithm to get an understanding of when quantum computers come around, how long is this really going to take? Okay, so initial estimates um, of a, of a uh, classical algorithm just make it completely intractable, but if you take the naive quantum algorithm, just write it out and start counting the number of gates, those are huge numbers that would just make it totally impossible even for quantum computers. But as we refactor these algorithms, we find better ways of implementing them, we find better tricks for computing pieces of them, we reduce the, the resource costs, we can eventually get these much more efficient implementations which make these things tractable when sufficiently large quantum computers come around. Okay, so resource estimation is a good way of looking forward, even though we're not necessarily going to run these on quantum computers today, to estimate what the impact of these algorithms will be on uh, industrial workflows in 10 years or 15 years or whatever time frame we're really talking about. Okay, so the, uh, the problem that keeps me awake at night is this one. Um, I mean, debugging quantum algorithms, I have enough time debugging classical algorithms. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, Chris is chuckling because this is his slide, and, and uh, so he printed off this, uh, this output, but this is exactly what I see whenever I write code and run it, is, uh, is just this, this complete mess. Um, and so quantum algorithms, uh, this is a real challenge. Uh, debuggers, as we understand them today, use sort of the, the same basic tools, right? You set a breakpoint, you look in there, you see what the state is, and is that what you expected? Well, in quantum algorithms, you can't do that. If you examine the state, you've destroyed the coherence, the entanglement, all of the nice quantum properties of that state that you want to actually complete the algorithm. So you may see some statistics at this point, but that might not give you a clue about where the, st where the, um, where the state is moving to. Right, so the concept of using breakpoints and debugging in that fashion just isn't going to work. Right, well, what else is there? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, um, so I lose a little bit, of, I lose a lot of sleep over that. But what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is actually um, bringing applications uh, today using, um, using quantum algorithms. Okay, so, so this is really what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, because, well, <laughs> debugging stuff is too hard. Um. All right, so, uh, so we've already seen uh, the notion of a, a stack. Um, indeed, uh, we're really, today we're going to talk about, um, I guess, what's mostly sort of hovering at the top of that top squiggly arrow there. Okay, I'm going to talk about chemistry, but we're going to have a lot of other algorithms that we talked about this afternoon. And really, we're talking how do we implement them? How do we create a code that would push them down into the control software? And I guess below that, we're really not, not going to discuss that too much. Uh, that's some, some complicated engineering. Um, and uh, and that's, that's really far away from, from what I do. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I'm afraid I, I can't really comment on that. But uh, what sort of applications can we see for 
for, uh, for quantum algorithms. Uh, so quantum chemistry looks particularly attractive because of these numbers along the bottom. When we run these resource counts, we think that yes, we can get real payoff in the 100 to 200 qubit range. Okay, so, so putting some numbers forward, uh, the, we, your mention of the IBM Q, which is their, uh, the quantum machine that they have in New York. Um, the original one that was on the web had five qubits. Uh, the new one has uh, 49. Um, in a kind of interesting topology. Um, I don't know exactly what, how big the next generation is going to be, but we're already starting to see this, this become realistic. Um, a couple years ago, Google promised the bristlecone chip, which was to have 72 qubits in a sort of grid-like topology, but we haven't seen that appear yet. Um, IonQ over in Maryland is promising 128 qubits. Those are ions. Um, I don't know how they're going to fit that into a linear trap, but, you know, Chris Monroe's a smart guy. Um, so... Yeah, these numbers don't look so outrageous. Now, of course, those are going to be very, very noisy computers. Okay, and so, so even though the, the sizes of them are in the ranges we're talking about, the length of the program you can run is going to be very, very short before the noise and decoherence overruns it. Okay, and so, so yes, these numbers say, all right, yes, we can talk about small quantum computers and we can think about these, but we also have to have long run times, and that's where we have to worry now, do we use this error correction on these noisy things, or do we attempt to build a, uh, a topological quantum computer, say, where the noise is small enough that we might be able to run these without the need for additional error correction. Okay, on the other hand, things like Shor's algorithm are in the thousands of qubits, um, and so that's sort of out of range. Material science also grows pretty big. Uh, machine learning, of course, is a huge promise, but there's a lot of uncertainties in the applications to machine learning. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a war going on there. Every time we get a new quantum algorithm uh, that improves machine learning, somebody comes and dequantizes it and says, well, here's a classical algorithm that will do just as good. All right, so there's been a lot of back and forth on that for the past few years, and so I'm not sure where that's going to finally end up. All right, so let me... Uh, let me just recapture what I said there. In the near term, uh, we have these, these machines that are coming out now. Um, most of them are based on superconducting qubits, uh, the, the one exception the one at IonQ being an ion trap. Um, topological things are still, um, well, I mean, I don't know because I don't work the, the hardware, but they're, they're not here yet. Uh, the length of the program is uh, probably talking about you know, a thousand, well, a thousand what? Well, let's say it's maybe a thousand cycles, of the analog of what a cycle would be in the computer, so a thousand time steps to get your algorithm done, and that's not nearly enough to do any significant size, size algorithm. On the other hand, if we want, uh, over here, we want to have these really long-term programs where we can run uh, millions and, or even billions of cycles which are, which are gonna be necessary, then we're gonna need to do something to control the error. Okay, either get the error correction directly in the, uh, the physical qubit itself or um, build error correction on top of it. Okay, so, so what I'm going to talk about really is quantum phase estimation. That's the underlying algorithm uh, that's uh, really driving a lot of these, these chemistry applications. Um, and it belongs to this category over here. Uh, it's unfortunately a rel relatively deep algorithm. It takes a long time to run, even though we might not require as many qubits for it. Okay, so, so in other words, we're not there yet. Okay, but, you know, five, t five years, ten years, we might be running up against the boundaries of what we can actually do. And, of course, at that point, then we want to use it. All right, so, uh, so here's an example of something uh, that you might actually want to see come out of one of these simulations. Uh, theory has a predicted uh, curve which relates the bond length in, uh, in a water, uh, sorry, a hydrogen uh, molecule here with the associated energy. And we'd like to simulate around this low point because that's going to be where we find the, the system at equilibrium. Okay, so the methodology for this uses the same methodology we've used for these sort of things for, uh, well, I mean, forever. <laughs> you somehow get the theory out of some research paper. You know, you go up to the whiteboard and you uh, work out what it is in terms of the simulation that you can do, and then you cut and paste it into your simulator, you know, be it in MATLAB or now in, uh, in Q-sharp, 
and, uh, and out come some plots which hopefully match pretty well with the theory that's been developed over the years. Okay, so, so very, very intensive and not scalable to, uh, to large things. Okay, so, uh, so what we did is team up with uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs, uh, which have the product uh, NWChem, which is a high power uh, quantum chemistry tool. This is really what, the, uh, what they work with. That's, this is their specialty. Um, and integrate all of the wonderful modeling that they have going on in that tool and bring it into the QKD so that we can simulate it directly and not have to go through the human intensive step of converting all of the various pieces to the right form that we can then put into simulators. Okay, and so, so here it's basically a, a four step process and I'll go through a little bit of these. Um, Broombridge is the name of the Protocol, um, this doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm talking about today, but it's such a nice picture that I just had to include it. Um, this is the, the, uh, the, this is Broombridge, I guess is what it is. It's, the, it's over the, the river, uh, over a river in Dublin. Um, and uh, the link, if you will, uh, you'd have to probably look a little bit for this, is that this is the bridge where uh, Sir Rowan Hamilton um, famously invented the rules for the Quaternions. Okay, and so what does that have to do with quantum chemistry? Well, you know, we use Hamiltonians and the name's Hamilton, so maybe a little bit tenuous there. But, uh, but it's a great picture, so, so I love it. Great story. But um, that gives us a format for a linking, sort of gluing these two pieces of sophisticated software together. We can get all of the appropriate chemical information that we'd like uh, using the modeling tools in NWChem, and here we see examples of this, and then this can be brought directly into appropriate tools to transform it into a Q-sharp simulator for the phase estimation or and, and other, other type algorithms for estimating energy levels, both ground state and excited state energies. Okay, so, uh, so this is a little bit, uh, you know, flashing code up there is no fun. Unfortunately, I'm going to get a little bit more of that, but uh, we're going to see a lot more of it as the day goes on. Um, here's really what's, what's at stage. The workflow here is about four steps, um, and this is characteristic of just about any real-world application you can imagine. Okay, you have some method of taking something of interest and then mapping it into a simple algorithm that you can run on a computer. Right? Now, every stage of that mapping typically has dozens of options uh, you can choose from. And so finding um, a method which will actually get you a result uh, requires sort of searching over all of these things. Okay, and, and of course, you know, that's, that's really where, where you know, the computer age has really brought us forward in technology is because we can automatically do those things. You know, if I wanted to find a fast algorithm for computing, you know, something in the, in the 19th century, I was, you know, digging through log tables and stuff like that, and that was just no fun. Okay, but now we can go through all kinds of different options, test them all out, and, uh, and, and just uh, find what's the best, and that is the method for going from this 3,000 year estimate to run this quantum algorithm down to this one day estimate to run this quantum algorithm. It's how do we choose the best of these to make an efficient implementation. Okay, so I'm going to briefly run through these, just so, you know, um, if you're interested in, in, uh, in quantum chemistry and simulation of these things, uh, all uh, this, this work that we've done on the, the chemistry library within the QDK has all of these little steps. Well, maybe I shouldn't say all of these little steps. It has at least one of the major choices for each of the steps in the reduction. Okay, so, and, uh, and you know, I'm going to flash up this pretty quickly because I want to get to the, get to the point. But uh, the, the docs actually explain everything that's going on, and there's sample code available. And so if you want to construct the Hamiltonian or, and then use, like, Georgia Wigner representation to convert it into some qubits, then the explanation of all that is there. And then the, the utilities for doing this has already been prepared, uh, deriving a qubit Hamiltonian. Um, again, everything's in there. If you go onto the docs, you can read about this. It's very interesting. Uh, what I'd like to spend time on here is discussing the simulation algorithms uh, because there's a lot of choices that can happen. Um, we'd like to implement Hamiltonian dynamics, which we can see in this slide going on right here. Uh, maybe the font is not 
an ideal choice. <laughs> but uh, so we'd like to implement unitary dynamics given by a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is given by a sum of uh, sparse Hamiltonians or simple to apply Hamiltonians. And so there's a mechanism for doing that, and here we're illustrating Trotter Suzuki, but there are many, many more. Uh, cubitization is another one, um, Taylor series is a third. Uh, and so, and each of those have numerous parameters. And so the, how, do we, how do we find the right thing to do and, uh, and run these? Okay, but before I, I talk more about that, uh, let me just illustrate what the output looks like. Okay, so here's the actual workflow. Uh, what we start with is our, uh, our MW chem box, as far as I'm concerned, which has all of the quantum chemistry built into it uh, that people can utilize. I'm not a quantum chemist myself, and so that it really is a black box for me. Somebody says, we're really interested in, say, nitrogenase, which is the enzyme that has the FAMOCO uh, molecule inside of it. And so that might be modeled up here under this bio models, uh, biomolecules uh, data that's in, in uh, an appropriate database. And that can be manipulated and, uh, and then exported in this uh, Broombridge file, which then can go through the Q-sharp simulator. We go through a variety of choices on how we select our options and then target, in this case, a resource estimator to say, is that option really a good one for simulating this compl complex molecule? And so how long would that take? And, uh, and then go back and forth. So what we'd like to see is something that looks like this. So here, lithium hydride uh, simulation. Uh, we like to understand these um, the ground state and, and excited state curves of how they re, um, of their bond length, because at the lowest one, that's going to be uh, where we have our um, our stable our stable states. Okay, and so and so here we're just seeing some outputs of some simulators. Yeah, the ground state we simulate the first excited state. There's some outliers as one as one would expect, but one can then put all this together and get a good uh, estimates. Uh, get good uh, empirical plots of the spectrum of this molecule um, using these tools. Okay, this is a very small one, and so the, the theory plots can be constructed directly, and so it's a nice, um, a nice example, a nice chemistry experiment here. Uh, it's it's which, which ones we're, we're looking at here. So for instance, this is just uh, simulating the ground state, and a couple of things didn't quite come out right. And here we're, uh, let, me, let me go up and erase the, the front one here. And here we're simulating the first excited state, and so you can see the outputs of the simulator tracking the energy levels for the first excited state. So we built that in. Um, I don't understand why, why it's producing things way up in, the, in, the, in nowhere land. Um, that's kind of curious. Yeah, you got those? Yeah, so that can sometimes happen because you learn the phase mod to uh, yep, it it'll it pop it, wrap, wrap around, okay, yep, and then pop it way up there. Yep, great, thanks. Okay, so yeah, so uh, well, ultimately what we're looking for is a plot like this where we can see all of the spectral lines of the molecule. All right, so uh, let's look a little bit at this resource estimation. Um, there's a variety of uh, options we have for Hamiltonian simulation, and each of them have different requirements in terms of the number of qubits that are required. Now, as we expect, we, we're gonna have limited number of qubits, so that's a major concern. But the trading off that, we also have the number of gates that are required, which is the length of the program that's gonna run, and so we'd like that to be short as well. Well, as expected, those are fighting against each other, and so there's a variety of choices we might wanna make. But in terms of actually doing it, all of this is already built into the QDK, and so it's relatively straightforward. We're seeing, um, well, pretty much all of the code right here. Now, yeah, I, here we have this thing called Trotter Step Oracle, which of course requires a, a, a great deal of work to build. And uh, Guang Hao, I imagine, has done a great deal of work in making this, uh, making this practical. But, uh, but really, once it's built into the, the Oracle, uh, once it's built into the QDK itself, it's relatively straightforward to use. Okay, and so in here, we can just estimate now the cost of Trotter Step Oracles based on some ideas, you know, what, what do we think would be good? How many, what order do we want? Do we want to do a first order approximation, like a linear approximation? Do we want to do quadratic approximations, et cetera? And what's the size of the steps we'd like to make? And now we can tune those to see what, see what comes out of it. Um, 
Okay, so I guess this, this slide is um, a little bit older than I was expecting, although I hope it's still up to date. Um, I, I, in fact, wanted to get the Python one in here, but I didn't. Uh, so this is the, the C-sharp wrapper that goes around that, uh, that Q-sharp piece of code. Um, you'll probably see a lot more of this this afternoon. Uh, and really, this little four-line four, four line statement right there is, the, in some sense, the driver which is running the quantum computer, if you will. Now, here we're just doing a gate count simulator, but, uh, but this is telling us to run this trotter step algorithm to simulate a Hamiltonian. And three of the four lines are about getting timings. Okay, and then the bottom area is here. This is just uh, getting statistics that we can then print off to the screen, and I'll show a picture of that in a moment, uh, or at least a graphic uh, that comes out of this. But really, there's not a lot to, to running the code itself. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but then you can create very, very efficient code bases that uh, automates this task um, really, really well. All right, so this is just the, uh, the Trotter case. Um, and so here is the output that comes out of that. Uh, there's a variety of choices. Uh, we talked about the, the Trotter one here. Cubitization is another one. Then there's an optimized cubitization, which attempts to uh, reduce, um, I believe in this case, it's reducing the, the number of rotations, I believe it is. OK, well, be that as it may, uh, you get these outputs from the simulator for all kinds of different uh, molecules, um, it's a little bit time consuming to do it, but we actually can count the number of gates that are required to do each of these. Okay, so for instance, on this uh, ferric sulfide, um, I'm not sure where it is in the table here, uh, it does not appear to be there, but it's on the chart that uh, will appear later. Uh, there's a variety of choices we can take. Uh, Trotter, for instance, gives us a certain number of rotations and a certain number of C-naught gates. Uh, in some sense, that's relevant to the, to the depth of the circuit. There's some more computation that has to be done to get that. Um, if we want to do uh, error-corrected things, which would be appropriate for the modern, um, modern superconducting-based computers, the T-count, T-gates are the stumbling block. And so we'd want to, to count those. In the optimized one, it's reduced the number of uh, non-T rotations to something that's uh, manageable, like 18. But still, we have, um, what is it, 69 million T gates, which tells us, I mean, that's really going to be the quantifier of how hard is this going to be to run. OK, then with some assumptions, this sort of guides the statement that, oh, we can do this in a day with an appropriate T-state factories that have been lined up in the right way. And that's complex. But, uh, but really, all I want to, want to do here is say that we have all these different options that can be automated. And then we can find efficient implementations by searching through these hyperparameters and, and selecting the best. OK, so just a quick overview of, of what all of these do. Um, minimizes T count. Uh, that's the optimized one over there. Um, and so, you know, we can choose uh, which are the best possible. And the, the answer is, well, of course, it's going to vary on what you actually want to do. And so the choice for a small molecule might not be the same as the choice for a larger molecule. It'll vary from one to the other. And so one has this now workflow that's been designed that can optimize this for all of the possible choices that you might be interested in. OK, so let me, uh, let me call up a quick picture here. OK, so here is the, the FOMOCO molecule here as part of the nitrogenase enzyme. OK, it's actually living, living out here. So, so what we see is uh, uh, along the top of these charts, these, these top lines, are, um, these are whiteboard results, right? We get up on the whiteboard. We say, all right, well, here's how the algorithm works. Let me think about how I would want to implement it and prove some upper bounds on its runtime, okay? Because I can get an implementation that, I, that takes only this long according to these asymptotics and heuristics that one might use. Uh, these get better and better as time goes on, um, but then we, can t then we can run these counts and the simulators, at least up to the size that uh, uh, our simulators will run on, to, to validate uh, where the real runtimes are for these types of molecules. All right. So getting to the end here, 
Um, I stole a slide from our marketing group because it has sort of nice pictures on it, and uh, hopefully this is very motivational. <laughs> so, so our goal again is to, um, to be over here where we can model these large molecules with a large number of atoms. Uh, classical computing is just not going to be tractable. Wow, you cannot see that curve on there at all. Okay, there is a very dark gray curve running up here indeed. These are all exponential algorithms. And so they very, very quickly become in incomputable with classical methods. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really, is, it really is there, but I can see it because I'm standing like right, right up against the, the screen here. But, uh, but quantum computers, well, they are physical devices, and so it's not surprising in some sense that they're very good at simulating physical devices. Okay, and so we can think of the quantum computer itself as a programmable physics lab. It's uh, actually estimating what's going on in a computation by doing the underlying physics uh, that the computation is, is modeling. All right, so, so let me finish uh, with, uh, this is, um, well, so same slide. Uh, so this is an uh, outlook of what we're going to do a little bit later this afternoon um, and, uh, and some links if you want to uh, look, up, look up all of these and, uh, and get started early. And I'm happy to take questions. I reserved a little bit of extra time because uh, you know, I, I hear we have results. You know, people want to hear about the quantum-inspired stuff as well. And so I'm happy to talk about that in, uh, in more detail or, or anything else. I mean, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well. I have a clarifying question. Uh, what is the, so you explained a lot about the process that goes mm -hmm. into developing these things. Yes. What is the process of finding fields where uh, a, quantum, a quantum computer can be useful in some sense? Right, okay, so, so yeah, in other words, how do you develop new quantum algorithms? Right. Um, that's, you, that's a very, very challenging, challenging process. And I guess it depends on, on um, if you're interested more in combinatorial things, and, and Robin's sitting here in the front row, so I might ha tap him to answer some of this. If you're looking for, for those, then there's sort of one approach that, that, uh, that you can probe um, more computer science types of approaches. If you want to look at uh, like real world applications, um, those often don't fall into these more combinatorial things, they're more continuous valued and the such. Um, and it's, and you know, it's like developing any algorithm, it's a, it's a one-off. You, you gain uh, inspiration about the algorithm itself, about the problem itself and then find new ways of, of examining it. Okay, so there are some very, very broad categories that work, and I've mentioned this already, um, quantum-inspired optimization. So adiabatic, uh, so the, at a very general level, adiabatic quantum computing is well-tuned to optimization because what it's doing is uh, finding the lowest energy configuration of a Hamiltonian. And so if I want to solve an optimization problem, I just cast that optimization, that objective function, as the Hamiltonian. Okay, and then the adiabatic process itself will, will find that. Now, the hard part isn't actually just writing down the algorithm. That's, the, that's in some sense the easy part. The hard part is analyzing how, how long is it going to take to resolve this? How long is it going to run? Okay, and what's the likelihood that it's actually going to find the solution that we want it to find? I mean, all of this is randomized. These are all randomized algorithms. Okay, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think there's any easy answer. I like, you know, well, I wanted to find a new quantum algorithm today. What do I have to do? Well, there's <laughs> no, no easy response there. Yep. Can you go back a couple of slides? Uh, yep. A couple of slides. There was a, it's a bunch of graphs. Next one. Yep. Yeah, okay. Oh, you want, no, so no, you no, want no, this, no, this no, one or this one? No, next, next. Okay, one. this one here. Next one. Yep. That one, okay. Right. So... What I didn't understand in this graph, these are all very interesting, but at the lower left, you've got the mm -hmm. Microsoft simulations. That's right. So, uh, so this is, um, well, once we get the, the um, Q-sharp program written out, the, so the quantum algorithm written out in terms of the code, we can just simulate what's going on. Okay, so if I have, say, 20 qubits, well, 20 spin orbitals, which then get converted into roughly 20 qubits, uh, 20 plus O of 1, I think is a <laughs> statement, um, then I can uh, just write that as a vector of those amplitudes. Okay, so let's pretend it was 20 for the moment, and so I, I'd have uh, 2 to the 20 complex amplitudes, so a million complex amplitudes I store in memory, and then every time I apply a gate 
I just adjust those amplitudes according to the action of the gate. Right? So at the end of the program, I have the, the, all these amplitudes. I just sample it. Okay? And so those, those plots where all those red, red dots appeared, that was what was coming out of these sampling. You sample it, you, get a, you actually get the, the, re, the result of the, of the simulation. Okay? But uh, if you start scaling this up, and so you know, up here, I don't know what number that is, say 24, 25, um, you know, the, this is becoming very memory intensive. Okay, so we're already talking to the megabytes. Uh, these are complex numbers of memory available. Obviously, we can get to gigabytes now without too much difficulty. If we move this up onto the cloud using Azure, then we can get this up to 30, maybe 35 uh, qubits, just because that's, you know, it takes a huge amount of memory to store all the amplitudes for that quantum state. Okay, so these, these other lines then are just... Yeah, these are all theory lines here. This is the resource counter. Right, so the resource counter doesn't actually simulate, it just says, well, how long is this going to take based on all of these gates that I've counted and the number of time steps that I predict it's going it's to run. So the current QSharp uh, software toolkit that you're going to show yep. us, is, it contains a simulator, but also the yep. resource counter? Uh, yep, it contains a simulator and the resource counter both. And, and it's just a one-line switch to go between the two. Do you instantiate the simulator? and then it runs a simulation, or do you instantiate the resource counter, and more or less, the, except for some trace commands, um, you know, the, the Q-sharp code's the same. But on my laptop, I shouldn't try to run the simulator on 80 qubits. No, probably not on 80 qubits. That, that would not be great. <laughs> Although 70 might be in range for certain things. Okay, so, uh, so going back to these quantum-inspired algorithms, um, the, the bristle cone, uh, when Google put that up, uh, announced that a couple years ago, and, and uh, they said they wanted to run what's called low-depth circuits, which is a technical name as well, um, this was going to be for their supremacy experiment. They were going to say that, well, with these low-depth circuits, now we can sample from distributions that you cannot sample from classically. Right? And to say not sample from classically means, of course, not sample from classically in any reasonable amount of time. Okay, so a few friends of mine down at NASA Ames, well, they have a great big, huge supercomputer there called Pleiades, and uh, they were able to take this low-depth quantum circuit problem and recast it as tracing a tensor network. Okay, so this is really along the exact same lines of these quantum-inspired things. We, we know we have a, a quantum algorithm. It's going to be hard to simulate that, but we can estimate that using a slightly different means, in this case, a, uh, tracing a tensor network, and they were able to do that up into the 50 qubit range. And they predicted that uh, you know, with about a day's runtime on the Pleiades supercomputer, they could do 72 qubits. All right, so, so 72 qubits are, is, then now that's in the, is that in the quantum inspired range now? Well, at least for maybe low depth circuits it is. For these really long circuits, uh, this, this technique's not gonna work. Right, so the, the boundary between what's quantum and what's quantum inspired is always moving. Yeah, no, it's a quantum annealer. And so, so quantum annealing is um, sort of the, the community name for adiabatic quantum computing at non-zero temperature. Okay, so temperature, thermal fluctuations have an, a, a real effect on that machine. We can't, you know, zero temperature doesn't exist in reality. We're always going to be in a non-zero temperature. And so they run at a handful of millikelvin. But thermal effects actually do have a non-trivial um, effect on the dynamics of that machine. But what it's, what it's meant to do is simulate adiabatic quantum computing using a quantum device. Now, it's very incoherent, but, uh, but it's actually a, a pretty, amazing, pretty amazing piece of machinery. Um, again, really easy to simulate using other methods like quantum Monte Carlo or diffusion Monte Carlo because we have the knowledge of simulating these using different types of algorithms. Thank you, Brett. Thank you.